from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. We believe the future of intelligent data apps will enable virtually all organizations to operate a platform that orchestrates an ecosystem similar to that of Amazon.com. Now by this, we mean dynamically connecting and digitally representing an enterprise's operations, including its customers, partners, suppliers, and even competitors. This vision includes the ability to rationalize top-down plans with bottom-up activities across the many dimensions of a business. For example, demand, product availability, production capacity, geographies, et cetera. Now, unlike today's data platforms, which generally are based on historical systems of truth, we envision a prescriptive model of a business's operations that is enabled by an emerging layer that unifies the intelligence trapped within today's application silos. Hello and welcome to this week's The Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, George Gilbert and I explore in depth the semantic layer that we've been discussing since early last year. And to do so, we welcome Mullum Araf, who's the CEO of Relational AI. Mullum, welcome to the program, sir. Great to see you. Great to see you, Dave. Uh, great to see you, George. It's always nice to talk to you. Okay, so let's just do a quick review here. We talked about the shift from an application-centered world to one that is data-centric, where logic is embedded in the data and not locked up in application silos. For decades, software has been all about automating processes. And now in the age of AI, we're automating decisions and AI is taking actions. And to enable this, we have to have unified metadata model. And we're moving from a world of historic systems of truth to a real-time model of an organization. Now to get us where we are today, we had to separate compute from storage to get to cloud scale. And now we think we need new technology to capture all the intelligence that was locked inside of the application silos so that we can coherently work with that shared data across the enterprise. This is what we call the semantic layer. So question for you, Mullum, what exactly is a semantic layer and how is it broader than the semantic layers that define metrics and dimensions for BI tools like we know from DBT, uh, at scale, look ML, et cetera? Yeah, uh, great question. So I, uh, as you said, people have been moving all their data onto these new super scalable uh, modern data stacks. Uh, and uh, sometimes people call, refer to them as data clouds. I know that Snowflake likes to refer to itself uh, as, a, as a data cloud. Yeah, and others. <laughs> and others, yes, uh, the Salesforce uh, <laughs> as well. So, uh, so that is, you know, solved a ton of problems for folks because it gives them the ability to go one place and find all the data they need. Like we, we as you said, we haven't had the scalable data management technology up until uh, now uh, that lets us do that. Okay, and so we put all data in one place, and now everybody who wants to consume data can go to this one place and get it. But um, what people realized is that data uh, in those places is fragmented. It still reflects the models of the, the database models, the database schemas from which the data comes from, okay? And those uh, databases are usually driving applications. And it's often the case that we see hundreds, thousands, in some cases, tens of thousands of applications uh, being driven by similar number of databases that feed into uh, the data cloud and the modern data stack. And uh, so the, the idea of a semantic layer emerged from the, uh, you know, trying to solve the next problem, which is how do I uh, avoid having everyone having to do the work to, to understand that, you know, item in one uh, database really means uh, product in another, really means SKU in another, okay? Can we unify uh, terms and can we uh, create a, a unified model of the business so that business people can speak in, in in one vocabulary, one taxonomy, one ontology, okay? And then we also realized that there's a lot of stuff that we left behind in the application logic uh, that were driven by those databases, okay? So you might, for example, compute a gross margin calculation in a bit of Java or a bit of C Sharp or a bit of Python. Um, what people who are using the modern data stack realize that is, you know, every dashboard builder, every spreadsheet user, every uh, uh, BI tool, every data scientist was recreating 
in an ad hoc way that definition you know uh how do you compute somebody's uh, age from their birthday uh there are just many things like that okay now there's a category of things and metrics that uh people um well uh, uh want to use when they're doing business intelligence and you know i think of semantic layers as coming in you know three different buckets okay there's the bi centric sql centric uh technology uh using dbt and lookml and at scale and some of the the technologies that you mentioned where it's really creating semantics around almost like a headless bi uh and you get to define the metrics once and uh, those semantics show up in the database. And instead of having to uh, figure out what gross margin is on a use case by use case basis, it's just in, in, the, in the system and you just look it up. Okay, and that mm -hmm. is obviously very important, very valuable. It creates a, uh, um, it, it makes those semantics shareable. It makes them um, accessible to non-programmers because now you have them de you know, declared. Uh, it makes it so that uh, typically it takes a lot less effort, a lot less lines of text and code uh, to express them. So they're easier to develop, maintain, uh, it to debug, uh, scale out. It also makes it possible to uh, reuse them uh, so that you don't have to replicate them all the time. And it makes it possible to optimize across them. Okay. Uh, and it makes it possible even to take that definition and map it to different underlying technologies, creating a little bit of vendor independence, um, you know, from the enterprise to, you know, who, you know, to the set of vendors and technology uh, technologies that they can use um, to support all of this. Okay. Uh, so that's all very good. And we're seeing, you know, a lot of people uh, move in that direction. Uh, there is a, a second, much smaller community. You know, this, the first community is doing this mostly in SQL or in um, domain-specific languages that map to SQL, that translate down to SQL. There's a second smaller community that's trying to capture semantics using the semantic web standards, you know, OWL, Sparkle, Shackle. And uh, uh, those technologies are not nearly as popular, but of course, the semantic web standards were created to capture semantics. And what's nice about them is that they're standards, you know, that aren't tied to, uh, you know, a DSL. Uh, and so we see some people moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. And then we see a third type of semantic technology that's based on uh, modeling and modeling languages. Um, one that we're very familiar with, with is called Legend. It was created at Goldman Sachs, and it helps them unify uh, build models basically across all the data silos and abstract over in uh, specific technologies. And so a lot of people at Goldman Sachs will interface with their data assets through the semantic layer based on legend. And they'll ask questions uh, of that system. And then that system can then generate a SQL query or a Python program or a Java program or whatever to get that that that, that those questions uh, answered. Uh, uh, Legend uh, has been open source, so there's some attempt at building community around that. Uh, other folks in financial services like Morgan Stanley have developed systems, a system called Morpher, for example. Uh, there are conceptual modeling tools that you can do this with. And we see actually quite a few enterprise application uh, companies develop their own semantic uh, layer. Um, Bullyonder has one, SAP has one, uh, uh, others have this, this semantic technologies, uh, rumor has it that Salesforce is developing one uh, to create an interface uh, uh, across these data silos, okay? Yeah. Uh, it, most of these technologies to date are backward looking semantics, metrics, et cetera. And I think the, the future of semantic layers is gonna be to incorporate intelligent semantics, um, things that predict, things that uh, do predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics, things that answer harder questions that you can, then you can uh, uh, answer just with uh, descriptive analytics and SQL and so on. Yeah, and we're going to unpack that today. So George, we have these various paths that Malam just kind of described. Um, take it from here. You and I have talked about what that future looks like and we're going to get to that, but let's talk a little bit about the, the DBMS as we know it, George. So yeah, Malam, just you talked about different approaches to capturing um, or to to representing semantics, but explain to us the technology that needs to be um, 
that can unify all those approaches and be forward looking, you know, can capture the predictive and prescriptive, but also describe, you know, all the entities and activities in a business, backward looking and forward looking. Why does why do we need new technology for that? Well, we certainly need new technology to capture intelligent semantics. Okay, most semantic layers don't really uh, uh, speak to that. They, uh, at some level, some of them let you call out into you know Python code and so on and call you know um, procedural uh, 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 systems. I should also, and we should also distinguish between semantics captured as code versus semantics captured as a model or relationally as uh, equations. Semantics captured as code suffer from a variety of problems, including the lack of shareability, uh, business people don't really uh, usually understand code, uh, and it ties you to particular technologies so that portability that I was talking about earlier uh, becomes uh, more problematic. So in, in, in you know, the mo a lot of the value to semantic layers, I mean, you know, comes from the fact that you're capturing the semantics declaratively in a technology independent way uh, and so on. So anyways, I think the right abstraction for uh, these richer semantics that power intelligence is a knowledge graph, uh, a relational knowledge graph specifically, so that uh, the knowledge graph, if it's relational, is compatible with the underlying uh, modern data stack and uh, data cloud, which is usually based on uh, the relational paradigm using SQL and, uh, and uh, relational query languages, okay? So when you have that as the right uh, as, a, as the abstraction for the semantic layer, you can now capture much richer types of knowledge, including statistical and probabilistic knowledge, um, you know, deterministic logic uh, knowledge, symbolic knowledge, and you can start to to answer uh, to think about answering questions that might require graph analytics or um, rule based reasoning or prescriptive analytics like integer programming and mathematical programming, the things that drive every supply chain network on the planet or predictive analytics, uh, and, you, know, um, you know, things from time series forecasting to simulation to probabilistic programming uh, to graph neural networks. Uh, these things are not possible in uh, the semantic uh, layers of today and ones that are not based on a relational knowledge graph uh, that, uh, that sort of brings the intelligence uh, to the table. Yeah, so we've talked about this uh, with our audience before that, you know, knowledge graphs are very powerful, they're expressive, but they're hard to query. And so that's something that, that relational AI, I believe is, is, is attacking, but I want to yeah. step back for a bit uh, and just to help people, again, set context. Today, we have a brute force way of getting at least part of the way there and this dramatic graphic that we're showing has Jean-Claude Van Damme. He was basically straddling two 18 wheelers and the trucks, you know, the, on, the truck on the left, it, it represents, you know, today's data platforms, right? The left, left side, which are mostly SQL DBMSs. And as the platforms incorporate more and more of the application semantics that we've been talking about, it gets, really gets harder and harder to straddle them. And so, of the major modern data platforms, you see Databricks with Unity, very aggressively trying to add semantics to its platform. Snowflake likely going to follow suit by building its own metadata catalog. Mm -hmm. AWS's data zone maybe gives us clues as to the direction that they're headed. You got Google's Dataplex seems to be going down this path. Microsoft Fabric in the power platform or maybe a likely path for them. Oracle's going to try to attack this from its very DBMS centric point of view you know, we'll see, but today, today we have this collection of bespoke tools that are spanning governance, security, metrics, data quality, observability, transformation. These like have to be cobbled together. So this graphic from ETR's Emerging Technology Survey, it's a survey of more than 1500 IT decision makers about which emerging tech platforms they're using. These are all private companies. So it shows some of the tooling that, that is representative and gets us part way to our vision of the future. The y-axis is net sentiment, or it's, an, it's a measure of intent to engage. The x-axis is mind share. You know, Grafana stands out a little bit. You see DBT and Fivetran, they're prominent, as is Calibra. But there are many, many choices that organizations have that requires them to stitch together different elements of the stack. But the Salesforce data cloud and, and Palantir platforms are somewhat instructive with respect to the future uh, 
At least we think so. George, could you explain that? Yeah, we actually, we talked to the EVP of the Salesforce Data Cloud recently. And what, what really is unique is that they're up-leveling today's data platforms by creating this metadata-driven um, set of semantics that also borrows the application semantics from the Salesforce operational apps. So that setting up a pipeline that ingests, transforms, um, and unifies all the data, it's now um, a configuration problem, not a code problem. And, and Palantir takes that somewhat further because they can model entities that represent you know, the rest of the business. So Molum, for, for customers that are today fully invested in you know, the, the big data platforms, could relational AI become a platform that hosts, that simplifies and enhances and even unifies this cobbling of tools that is an attempt to start adding semantics? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, one of sort of our fundamental principles here as we go to market is that we want to meet people where they are. So we don't, uh, you know, the way we go to market is we go to market, for example, as a coprocessor, an AI coprocessor for data clouds, okay? Uh, starting with Snowflake, uh, which we think has a very compelling data cloud offering, but, you know, we think highly of other data clouds uh, like, uh, you know, Fabric and, and Salesforce and, and, and others, okay? So we are already meeting people where they are in the sense that our system runs inside Snowflake. It runs inside the security per perimeter and leverages all the governance machinery that's going to come with that system. Okay, it's also architected like uh, uh, Snowflake. Remember, we're we're adding support for workloads that these data clouds don't support. Okay, graph analytics, uh, prescriptive analytics, predictive analytics, uh, and so on. So. Uh, we have to, you know, um, eliminate friction as much as possible, like, you know, copying data out, synchronizing it, uh, re-securing it, re-governing it. All of that goes away, um, you know, in, in our model. And so we are, um, you know, architected like Snowflake so that we you, we can provide the same kind of experience that made Snowflake and systems like it so compelling relative to uh, Hadoop and Teradata and these sort of non-cloud native uh, solutions. Uh, and then at the paradigm level, we're trying to meet people where they are because the paradigm of data is the relational paradigm, okay? And asking people um, to do data-centric things in paradigms that were not, you know, that were invented for coding and for application development uh, is not helpful. We've also positioned our knowledge graph as a, um, as a target for these semantic layers that we're talking about, okay? So when we, we've worked with uh, uh, Legend, for example, again, their users work at that level and it transpiles down to uh, uh, various systems, including ours as a target. And th the point that you're making is a very valid one. If an enterprise ends up with 17 different semantic layer technologies, they're not going to be helping themselves. And so the opportunity here in this transformation as we go from application centric to data centric and having all the data in one place is now instead of getting your model you know, on a per application basis or per vendor basis, your model is now of your enterprise, okay? And you have to own that. You have to own those semantics, okay? And so treating semantic layers as just another, you know, set of technologies and having, you know, 10 different approaches to it is not going to let you capture all the value that you can capture from a semantic layer. Uh, the world, I think, wants to have... Um, a unified model of the business, okay, which can't come from a vendor. It's going to come from the business. It's about your business, your enterprise. And they want to be able to express that model in a way that's not code-based so that it's it's portable. It's It can, you know, be expressed in, you know, whatever semantic technology, uh, you know, makes sense. And then those, those portable declarative relational semantics get, you know, behind the scenes compiled down to whatever target system uh, or systems you want to use. We, we, okay. love the, we love this vision and we think we're very much aligned with it. Um, but I got to push you a little bit, Mahalan. Please. You're being very diplomatic here because yeah. you're, you're thinking about relational AI as complementary, you know, versus kind of disruptive to existing data platforms. You call it, said it like an AI coprocessor for data clouds. I, I can't help but think of an NVIDIA as an AI co-processor for x86, but, but, but exactly. you see it as complementary, not disruptive, yep. but if this independent sort of semantically enhanced data fabric comes to fore, 
doesn't the data platform become kind of just a storage engine? Um, you know, look, I, I don't think these things are easy to build, like building systems like Snowflake and BigQuery and, uh, you know, Fabric and so on. They're not easy to build. So, yeah, all the big players are going to have one of these. Uh, and, you know, all the enterprises we work with don't want to be held hostage by any one of them, right? We typically see, uh, you know, more than one of them in an enterprise, okay? Right. And so if you tie your semantics to a vendor, uh, you know, where you're getting all the compute stuff, okay, uh, you're, you know, you're tying, you know, there are some, you know, pluses and some minuses to that, uh, to say that diplomatically, okay? So I do think semantics done right have to be independent uh, of technology. And I do think this NVIDIA actually analogy from our perspective is a very positive one because it's worked out really well for all the CPU manufacturers. They got to focus on being CPU manufacturers and it worked out really well for NVIDIA, as we know. <laughs> and, you know, in your device, um, you don't use the, the the GPU for many things. You, you don't use it for word processing or email or spreadsheeting. But when you need it, you really need it. Because when you need intelligence, when you need visualization, when you need uh, graphics and so on, uh, it's uh, much, much more cost effective to have something on the motherboard that can have access to the memory that you have on your system. Uh, it's well integrated and you just farm out that work to it without having to leave your laptop or your uh, iPad to go to a specialized device uh, for gaming or for whatever that you're doing. Right? Okay. So this is a, a new way of thinking about working with these platforms, with these data clouds that are trying to be much more than databases. They're really like what Snowflake is doing today. Is they have the opportunity to be what Oracle was in the 90s, you know, the platform that everybody builds their applications on, right? And so they need to open it up for co-processors and for, for people like us to augment it. Right. Well, look, we've had decades of challenges in, in building top-down enterprise models, which you, got, you alluded to before. Um, you know, custom built enterprise data models gave us packaged apps, think SAP, Oracle, NetSuite, Salesforce, EDWs, enterprise data warehouses, rather than, you know, data warehouses and data marts. Even BI has been sort of challenged to get widely adopted with shared semantics. We talked about DBT, you know, at scale is another example we often use. But then you got these bottom up metrics, bookings, billings, revenue, you got top down dimensions like the organizational hierarchy. But the question we have, Mullum, is how do LLMs fit in this whole equation and can they simplify this, you know, what is often seen as a, a, a mess or at least a challenge for many organizations? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, but that definitely uh, LLMs have been a gift uh, to, to people in, in our business, right? And the people building semantic layers, uh, a real uh, breakthrough. And the nice thing about LLMs and knowledge graphs uh, is, is it's very symbiotic. Uh, you can use an LLM to take out, uh, eliminate a lot of the labor involved in creating a knowledge graph by having it mine knowledge from all the places that exist in an enterprise, uh, from applications, from documents, uh, from images, uh, there's a you know um, knowledge in people's heads even. Uh, so it's a very useful tool for making the construction of a semantic layer um, easier, uh, cheaper, easier to evolve and so on. Uh, and when you have that semantic layer in place, that, that knowledge graph, that semantic layer makes it, uh, uh, makes the language model much more effective at answering questions that it wouldn't be able to answer if you just pointed it at, uh, you know, uh, a bunch of data that, uh, you know, we typically see, you know, it's not it's not uncommon to see 100 million columns of information uh, across, uh, you know, all these databases moved into systems like, uh, like Snowflake and so on, right? So in the same way, the semantic layer and the knowledge graph make it easier for you and me to navigate these very complicated data silos, uh, we can do the same for our language model by giving it a cleaner abstraction, uh, representing our enterprise using a few hundred co concept concepts at most, okay? Even though we might have 100 million columns or 200 million columns of, of data, no, even the most complicated Fortune 10 enterprises 
uh, don't have more than a few hundred concepts that you need to, you know, understand uh, to, to model them, you know, concept of a customer or a product or an employee or a, a store or a manufacturing facility. There's just mm -hmm. not that many unique concepts in an enterprise. Now, how you relate those concepts to each other, you know, uh, is where the complexity lies in and language models can help us discover those relationships, can help us name them in a way that's consistent, can know that uh, in some cases item can be mapped to SKU, which can be mapped to product, which can be mapped to article, if you're using SAP, they call them articles, uh, and, and help us keep it, uh, you know, lower the costs of evolving the semantic layer as businesses evolve and as the world evolves and, and so on. Now, you need a little bit more than that. You need processes that let you decompose your business so it's not you know, a, a monolithic model where you can think about, you know, business function specific uh, uh, sub models that use that same set of standard concepts that we agreed to are going to be the concepts that we use in our enterprise. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it's it's a few hundred concepts. It's, you know, you can get your arms around that. What you can't get your arms around is 200 million columns of, of, uh, of data. You know? Right, right, right. So, I guess maybe we maybe it's not the center of gravity shifting, but there's clearly value shifting. Um, you know, where the DBMS was sort of everything, whether it's Oracle or Snowflake or whatever, and there's this metadata and intelligence that's defining the business entities uh, that, that you're talking about, Mullum and George, you've, you've mentioned many times. Salesforce Data Cloud, Palantir, sort of examples, but there's this move to a prescriptive intelligent model of the business. That's the future, that, the picture that we're trying to paint. So, and maybe an example is what Blue Yonder is building on top of relational AI and on top of Snowflake actually. Moem, I wonder if you could, you could talk about the movement across the three stages, i.e. DBMS centric to metadata centric to this intelligent model of the business and how that unfolds. How do you see that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Blue Yonder is doing really great work in uh, in this area. They made uh, uh, the leap, I think, very effectively. They're in the process of sort of replatforming everything on top of Snowflake. Okay, and uh, that's already, I think, um, you know, been very positive for them because it's been very positive for their customers because their customers typically are large enterprises that have data spread across hundreds and thousands of databases. Uh, and they have application centric uh, systems and they're moving all their data onto Snowflake. And so Blue Yonder is saying, okay, we're going to move the applications onto Snowflake and we're going to, you know, be part of this new uh, world uh, as an application provider. Okay. And so it's very, uh, uh, you know, very creative, very clever, I think, for them to sort of adopt this. It's, uh, you know, understanding the, 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 the industry trends. Now, in that process, they have a business logic, they have semantics that are uh, today, you know, at the starting point was they're all written in, you know, programming languages. Uh, they have code-based semantics. And in that process, we're working with them to see, can we actually have these semantics be relational? Can they be based on a knowledge graph and have them be relational? Now, as you you know about Blue Yonder and SAP and many others, when you're, when you're um, you know, helping uh, run someone's supply chain network, it's very important that you know you can do predictive analytics because you need to know what demand is going to be next week, next month, next quarter. It's very important that um, you can do prescriptive analytics. Uh, I mentioned earlier that you know integer programs run the world because no no airplane or truck or train or ship goes from point A to point B without being scheduled using the sophisticated uh, prescriptive analytics. Okay. And so we've seen already um, with some of their applications, we were able to recently re uh, replace uh, about 116,000 lines of, in, their, in this case, it was C++ code, uh, some you know, old application logic with 3,000 lines of knowledge graph of relational rules, okay? The implications of that are immense because the, a lot of the costs in uh, you know building software is attached roughly to lines of code, and uh, when you can cut it by an order of magnitude or even two orders of magnitude, 
uh, you know, your cost of development goes down, your cost of uh, testing goes down, the quality, the number of defects are tied to uh, lines of code, your ability to evolve your software, your ability to share that business logic with your customers and have that have them evolve it and tailor it for their businesses uh, is increased substantially, okay? So uh, real game changing stuff. And I think the sooner most application companies come to terms with the fact that the world is becoming data centric and we're moving to these data clouds, uh, the more relevant they're gonna be in the future because they have these amazing assets around all these semantics and all this knowledge about how to drive a supply chain network or how to, you know, um, run, uh, you, you know, analyze a wireless network or a cellular network for quality of service or all these things that, all this IP, all these semantics that are, you know, uh, trapped in code can now be moved into these knowledge graph based systems, these intelligent systems and uh, can be deployed on these data platforms that everybody wants to be on. Let me jump in, Dave, <clears throat> and just follow this up with, Mullum, maybe you can elaborate that you've talked about in the past, how we've had separate stacks for diagnostic analy analytics, pres predictive, prescriptive, the planning simulation and optimization were all separate stacks. What can, you do with something like Blue Yonder when all of those are integrated and you can do all of that modeling in in one coherent, you know, to create one co coherent prescriptive model. Give us some use cases. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, look, in the supply chain world, you you are talking about, uh, I mean, that's, that's a very rich area for these types of, uh, you know, sophisticated analytics, right? You don't just do descriptive analytics uh, in, in, in actually most industries, right? Like in financial services, you do this stuff. In telco, you do this stuff. In retail, you do this stuff. CPG, you do this stuff, okay? Um, these uh, uh, applications have been running the world using this very sophisticated technology. Just, we don't see it as consumers uh, typically. And so think about the alternative. Think about how people have had to do this, right? So imagine, you know, you're, you know, the world is moving all this data into this, into these data clouds. And now you want to do, I'm going to pick graph analytics, rule-based reasoning, prescriptive analytics, and simulation. Okay. Historically, these things have needed point technologies, okay, that required you to pull the data, like you just spent a lot of time and energy and you're excited about having all your data in, in a data cloud. Now you have to pull it back out again. It's no longer secured. Uh, it's no longer governed. Uh, now you have to worry about synchronization. You have a copy out there somewhere in the world, right? Is it really up to, uh, you know, in sync and, and all of that? Uh, it's typically moved into a point solution that's not cloud native. So it doesn't have the elasticity and the scalability and the consumption-based pricing that you have in a, in a data cloud. And it's not relational. Like you're talking about gobs of friction and gobs of, uh, of cost and headaches and risks and, and so on. So by in this coprocessor model, by moving support for those workloads into the data cloud, it's as if Snowflake supported all this stuff. It, it can do now, Snowflake magically can do graph analytics and, uh, and rule-based reasoning and prescriptive analytics and simulation. And so all that glue disappears. Okay, and it's not just the cost of the, 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 the developing the glue in the, in the first place. It's that you don't have to now, if you change a field in your application or your model, you don't have to go replicate it across all the point technologies, et cetera. You just put it, you know, you make a change in one place. And so it's not just a, you know, technology savings. It's a, it, it lets you operate at a totally different level of speed. You can evolve your models faster. You can evolve your business faster because technology is not holding you back. Okay, so it's a it's a real game changer if you can bring intelligence to the semantic layer and bring intelligence to the underlying data uh, uh, cloud, so that you don't have to leave these systems to go get a prediction here, a language model there, uh, uh, a simulation somewhere else, a you know a graph analytics somewhere else. Uh, and rule-based reasoning somewhere else. Okay, so, I hope, uh, I hope uh, my enthusiasm is clear. <laughs> would would an example be that um, you might have, it's something like where Amazon, it, it almost runs with um, very few hands on the wheel. So they might, their, their planning process is tied to operations, but their operations learn and update forecasts, which replan and then 
drive operations some more in almost like a closed learning loop. Is yeah. it something like that? You know, that's exactly what, what, what I'm talking about enables exactly that. Okay. And you should bring Duncan on uh, from Blue Yonder and I'm sure he'll tell you about uh, what they're working towards, but that's exactly what we're trying to do is uh, uh, make it so that there's a digital twin of your business uh, you know, the semantics sort of capture enough of your business where now you can get a feedback loop, you know, in business, you put in money, you get out money, you can sort of monitor that feedback loop and make the adjustments you need to make in terms of how you allocate capital to labor or to inventory or to equipment or to real estate or to all these things that, uh, you know, give you a return. How do you allocate it optimally? Okay, so that you maximize the value coming out of your business. Okay, if you if you have a hodgepodge of tech that's disconnected and siloed, it, you know I haven't seen anyone be able to do uh, anything resembling that. Uh, you know, in a in a siloed world. Okay, you can you can have you can do it locally. You know, uh, you have a price optimization or replenishment optimization or logistics optimization, but you cannot do it holistically because these silos can you know are just disconnected. Yes. So it's it, it really it's the that's going to be the, the the application companies the solution companies let's call them okay that work on this platform that let you do that that let you create artificial general business intelligence okay uh, self driving businesses uh, really is what you're talking about George okay they need to be on this platform yeah so so Blue Yonder for those of you who don't know so Duncan is Duncan Ango who's CEO of Blue Yonder which comprises a you know, big chunk of their business is the old man logistics business, which is obviously and legacy, I, but they're- I too. Yeah. And, JDA, yes, right. And they're taking Red those Hat, you know, assets uh, Prairie, I mean, yeah. and bringing together this modern sort of supply chain uh, system that Mullum's uh, describing. I want to ask you, when you have this coherent metadata based model of all your data, we talked about LLMs and the role that they play in simplifying the, the legacy processes. A lot of people are really, uh, excited about uh, what they consider state-of-the-art retrieval augmented generation or RAG approaches, could this future leapfrog the, the RAG? It's almost like RAG I'm, I'm hearing, is, you didn't say this, but I'm asking, is it a stepping stone to this self-driving business that becomes the new legacy? <laughs> Look, I think RAG is an important technique for interfacing language models, which represent mm -hmm. Uh, like a statistical model, let's say, uh, of of the world. Okay, I mean these are amazing uh, uh, things, but they're, you know, even if you can make language models as smart as you and I, okay, I know you and I are more effective if we have access to a library and a computer and a calculator and all these things. Okay, and so RAG is a way of connecting uh, the the language model to the sort of the deterministic or symbolic assets and the data assets that you have. Okay, it's there's actually a, it's an, a it's a term for an umbrella of techniques that people used to do that. And uh, what I, you know what I think people are coming to understand that RAG isn't just about semantics expressed as vectors in a vector database, which is a very important you know technology and very important component. It's also about explaining to the language model how things work by showing it a, a set of concepts. Hey, I think of my business as having you know these concepts and a set of relationships, and and uh, um, you know you can say it's different from RAG or you can say it's a different kind of RAG. I don't care. Uh, it's a sort of retrieval, uh, uh, you know, augmented. Uh, and so what you're retrieving here is not just vectors, you can retrieve, you know, other types of knowledge and other types of semantics that you can feed into a language model and and, uh, and get that feedback loop going, okay? Right. Right. So, you know, it's, uh, again, it's, 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 these models have been around for a year and uh, I, can, I can assure you that our, all of our customers, uh, you know, who represent some very large enterprises are uh, very actively investing and in trying to figure out how do you combine that technology with their existing, uh, you know, classic AI technologies as well as their data technologies uh, to create something much more powerful. Yeah, awesome. So we've been talking about the future. So let's let's explore kind of a little bit of what's possible when applications can represent this end-to-end -end prescriptive model of the business, which tells you what should happen or, or what you should do versus what did happen. And George, we're showing this the graphic here that you did. 
using Amazon.com as sort of the, the metaphor for the future. We talked about Uber for all, we're talking yep. about Amazon for all here, Amazon.com that is. Explain um, your thinking uh, in this workflow here. Okay, and <clears throat> this is what Mullen was, was starting to talk to um, with the blue yonder um, scenarios, but in the past, our enterprise applications were operational applications mainly, and they they tracked what did happen. And the the big advances over decades were trying to integrate um, processes across functions and divisions, and you know even globally. And what what we were talking about really, this is recapping what mullum has been saying, is that not only are we integrating the processes, but we're integrating predictive and prescriptive models along with the the sort of planning simulation optimization that might inform those models so that it works across functions. And I think the technical term is fan out so that you can look at it from different angles, even if you don't you didn't originally um, uh, forecast or plan from that angle. the the models fill that out. and and th that's sort of a recap. and and Mullum, you've talked to this. I would ask only one last question, which is, um, the legacy packaged applications that did so much work to integrate all these processes, um, where do they fit in a world where you start layering a prescriptive model on top of them where they are just one island in this bigger model? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I look, I don't think we're going to like rewrite all these applications overnight, okay? And some of these might never be re rewritten where, you know, semantics will stay in code. Uh, and they, you can think of them as services that you can call into and you know get answers to certain questions. Uh, again, all the application companies and a lot of the enterprises we work with are sort of in the process of figuring this out. So uh, the nice thing about these data clouds is that you, there is a process to migrate that you know uh, uh, into the data cloud first, okay, using containers and using uh, things like that, operating in there, and then buying yourself time to um, you know. Uh, capture the semantics that are embedded in there and surface them so that business people, uh, you know, understand what's going on. Okay, so you know, I live in uh, in Silicon Valley, and here you hear of VCs investing in next generation app companies. Okay, that are very specifically attacking this problem because you know apps that have their semantics in code are not accessible to business users. And business users, their only option is like, okay, well, it doesn't do what I want. Either buy another app that does what I want, or I'll copy some data out of it, put it in an Excel spreadsheet, build my own model, and you know, self-serve my analysis, which is very limited, okay? And so if you're building an app company today, okay, uh, you would do it on this, in this new data-centric way, new data-centric uh, architectures, platforms, uh, AI, and, and, and so on. Uh, but, you know, of course, uh, there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of knowledge, a lot of semantics captured in, in code in, in these applications that uh, at a minimum we should be able to leverage and so that we can, you know, over time, um, you know, refactor and, and uh, you know, unify the semantics, you know, as, as, uh, as models, as, uh, uh, as, as relational semantics. Well, Mullen, okay. we've been working on this vision of the six data platform and, and to trying to poke at this semantic layer. And it, it seems pretty obvious to us that relational AI is a, is a key potential component there. Can't thank you enough for spending some time with us today. You know, George and I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the time. Thanks. All right, you bet. And thanks to Alex Meyerson, Ken Schiffman, who are on production and do our podcast. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hof is our editor in chief over at siliconangle.com. Remember, the, all these episodes are available as podcasts wherever you listen. Just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. I publish each week on wikibon.com, soon to be thecuberesearch.com, and siliconangle.com. And you can email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante. Comment on our LinkedIn post. Check out etr.ai, the best survey data in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for George Gilbert and the Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for walking, watching and we'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.